Rotary, Colombo, Port City. Good evening to my Rotary friends and friends of Rotary. It gives me an immense pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Vicky Vikramasinghe, who is married and 64 years and current chairman, managing director of AgriWorld Private Limited. He also honorary counsel of Israel in Sri Lanka. He holds Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the University of Peradeniya, and he completed his schooling in Mind the College, God. He also served in private sectors and well as public sectors. He served as an assistant director of Department of Agriculture. Within three years, he was promoted to Agriculture Officer, Department of Agriculture. And also he served in private sectors such as Managing Director, Agro, Agro Private Limited, also being research assistant to Dr. Mark C. Hodge of University of Manchester. One of his achievements in public sector was working with integrated rural development of agriculture in Nurali district with the assistance of the government of Netherlands. Also implemented seed potato production along with the seed production dep department. He also worked very closely with the AGN project funded by the USAID until the project wound up and activities were transferred to the National Agribusiness Council in which he was the founder member. He also was a key member of the government delegation which visited India and Thailand in 2002 to formulate the national agricultural policy and involvement, involved in the preparation of the visit reports. The main objective of the visit was to study interaction between the farming communities with large group of companies such as CP Group in Thailand, Maharashtra Hybrid Seeds Company, Tafe Farms, etc. in India. He also a past president and an active member of the Seedmans Association of Sri Lanka. He intensely involved with the formulation of the agriculture sector plan, plans in the Regaining Sri Lanka, the policy paper of the government of Sri Lanka from 2001 to 2003. He was a member of the committee appointed by the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development, which drafted the revised Plant Quarantine Ordinance and Seed Act in 2004. He arranged visits for four ministers of agriculture to Israel to obtain first-hand knowledge in modern agriculture. He also promoting business ventures in Sri Lanka through his extensive contacts with the government of Sri Lanka in the sector of road development, communication, and etc., working with Spanish, Israel, and French companies in promoting said projects. He also a member of the committee appointed by the Secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture, Mahaveli Irrigation and De Livestock Development in June 2020 to restruct restructure the mandate of the agriculture sector modernization program. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Mr. Vicky Vikramatunga to share his thoughts on the topic of fertilizer and agrochemical ban, the impact on the agriculture sector. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Rotary and Savish, uh, for that uh, beautiful introduction given to me. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, I really appreciate uh, the, the time given for me to explain uh, and elaborate a little bit about this uh, recent uh, fertilizer and agrochemical ban, which uh, is affecting right now to, uh, especially to farming community in uh, Ampara and in rural areas. Nurelia is my, like my home because I worked there for four years uh, way back in 1980s. So uh, it's uh, a privilege and a pleasant uh, uh, situation for me to be here and address you all. So let me uh, start with a little bit of the background about the uh, uh, policy decision made by the government of Sri Lanka to uh, ban import of uh, synthetic agrochemicals and organic fertilizers. Along with that, uh, I will uh, go with my presentation. So that's... Uh... <clears throat> can you all see the screen? Yes, Mr. Company, we can. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, first I will uh, talk about uh, uh, the history uh, going back to uh, this particular stoppage or the ban on uh, fertilizers and agrochemicals. Uh, on the 22nd of April 2021, that's this year, Cabinet of Ministers approved the proposal by uh, His Excellency the President uh, to impose a complete ban on import of organic, inorganic fertilizers and all synthetic agrochemicals to the country. And uh, the reason given was that, you know, this was uh, in the manifesto of uh, the present government, Vistas of Prosperity and Splendor. Uh, so going along with that, of course, you know, in, in, the, in the manifesto, it was mentioned that uh, the ban will be, uh, I mean, of course, you know, the, the, it will take, during the period of 10 years, uh, the country will go into organic agriculture, but uh, this was an overnight, uh, decision, you know, all night ban on uh, all these two, uh, both these items. So uh, then on the 6th of May, 2021, uh, just a few days, I mean, two weeks after the cabinet decision, gazette number 2222648 was issued, uh, the making that above decision with uh, effective with immediate effect. Then uh, any shipments that were not shipped prior to the 6th of May, that was the date of the Gazette, were not permitted to be, uh, not permitted to be unloaded. BLs, I mean, bills of lading, which is issued by the shipping companies uh, after the 6th May were not to be accepted. All banks were instructed to stop issuance of letters of credit to import the banned items with immediate effect. So this was uh, how it was implemented. Then uh, the president appointed a task force uh, 43 member presidential task force on creating green Sri Lanka with sustainable solutions to climate change under the chairmanship of Honorable Basil Rajapaksha. This was appointed on the 10th May and on the 11th May, uh, the president held a meeting at the presidential secretariat with the members of the presidential task force. Uh, I was a member of this presidential task force until uh, end of July. On 31st of July, they changed the, uh, they reconstitute the, inter, reconstituted the task force, making the number of members, bringing down the number of members to 25. I'll explain that later. So task force was mandated to successfully implement the inorganic fertilizer and synthetic agrochemical ban in Taelia. Many other tasks entrusted in relation to creating a green Sri Lanka. So it was not only the uh, implementation of uh, inorganic fertilizer and synthetic agrochemical ban, but there were many other subjects which were mandated to this particular task force. So it was uh, reconstituted by extraordinary asset number 2002-2238, stroke 20 on the 29th of July and reduced the number of members to 25 and Honorable Mahinda Maravira was appointed as the chairman. So the current status of the uh, fertilizer and agrochemical ban, it is fully implemented and uh, cabinet of ministers on 31st of may 2021 there were there were protests by the other farming community and especially uh, the people uh, who are into uh, different uh, i mean protected agriculture and uh, high tech agriculture there was a, uh, there was a uh, protest by them and then of course the 31st of may 2021 cabinet approved import of carbonic fertilizers there is nothing called carbonic fertilizers but it is organic fertilizers and natural mineral, minerals and chelated. I mean, it's not chelated, it is chelated as I have put in, in the proper, proper wording uh, on the uh, slide. Herbal trace minerals and appointed the committee to monitor the imports. This is exactly the wordings that, you know, which was in the, uh, the press release released by the government department, information department. Later, the government abandoned the import of compost, organic manure. And after realizing that the said import could have violated quarantine regulations because according to the quarantine act in Sri Lanka and uh, this is plant quarantine and animal quarantine both prohibit the import of any organic manure or uh, any living organisms from outside from any other country because of that you know they stopped this import of a plan of importing compost. Then uh, right now the, uh, there is a tender which had been floated to uh, import organic fertilizers containing minimum of 10% nitrogen and it is rumored that a large volume is to be imported from China by the government by a government company. But uh, for your information, there is no uh, uh, organic fertilizer which contains 10% nitrogen except for blood meal that I will explain a little later. And uh, uh, the, so I, I'm sure that you know this particular fertilizer may be 
contaminated with inorganic fertilizers. So used for mixed with fertil inorganic fertilizers. So protected agriculture sector was given permission to import some of the fertilizer mixtures by gazette number 2238 stroke 45 on the 31st of July, issued by the finance minister. So this was just uh, one month ago. Uh, right now, there is no protocol developed by the National Fertilizer, Fertilizer Secretariat, which is mandated to uh, regulate and control the import of fertilizers to the country. There is no protocol developed even up to now. So uh, then a list of 25 agrochemicals coming to agrochemical side, because but it's not only fertilizer, it is even the synthetic agrochemicals were banned. So 25 agrochemicals were uh, picked by hand picked by uh, the registrar of pesticides and few other organizations some research institutions and then uh, this had been presented to the government uh, cabinet i mean cabinet meeting on the 30th that was two days ago but it was not approved so that means there is no uh, uh, agrochemicals at the moment which could be imported so current situation is there, there are no nutrients for agricultural crops no agrochemicals for control of pests and diseases this is the current status and even today, I think you may have seen uh, there was a, a news, article, news item about uh, rubber. So there is a, a leaf disease which is going around and you know they predict that they expect 25-30% uh, 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 loss of yield due to this particular leaf disease. So going on this subject, you know, the impact on this uh, agrochemical and uh, fertilizer and I would like to explain you a little bit about organic agriculture and you know what is eco-friendly agriculture. How it can be uh, how, how it is true uh, aspects of organic agriculture in the world. So, uh, organic agriculture is defined by the Food and Agricultural Organization and WHO uh, by Codex Elementary uh, Commission in nineteen ninety nine. Uh, organic agriculture is a holistic production management system which promotes and enhances agroecosystem health, including biodiversity, biological cycles, and soil biological activity. It emphasizes the use of management practices in preference to the use of farm inputs, taking into account that regional conditions require locally adapted systems. This is accomplished by using where possible agronomic, biological, and mechanical methods as opposed to using synthetic materials to fulfill any specific condition function within the system. This is the uh, definition given by the Food and Agricultural Organization. Then, of course, there is an organization called IFORM, which is uh, uh, International uh, for, um, uh, Foundation on uh, agri uh, uh, Organic Agriculture Movements. Uh, that is a uh, German-based uh, German -based foundation. So it is given, it has given a different definition, but it is almost similar to the other one. So going on the same subject, uh, there are two main governing bodies, that is International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements that I just mentioned, that was founded in 1972. And then of course, there is a Research Institute of Organic Agriculture founded in 1973 in Switzerland. These are the two main organizations which are governing the organization in the world. So looking at the extents under organic agriculture. Now you can see that you know uh, the entire world. These are 2019 figures. We had 72 million 300 thousand hectares under organic agriculture, and uh, we are talking about making Sri Lanka 100 percent agriculture. I will come to that later. And the entire world, we have only 1.5 percent of the total agricultural land under organic. And in Sri Lanka, we have had uh, in 2019 we have had 7,436 hectares. And uh, that is 2.5% of the total of 2.8 million hectares of agricultural land. So we have had 2,338 growers registered for organic agriculture. And uh, I would like to uh, give you an insight to, you know, just run down uh, to organic agriculture, what it is. And, you know, so this is, the, all these figures are copied from this uh, document, which is called the World of Organic Agriculture Statistics and Emerging Trends 2021, published by the two organizations, what I mentioned before. So these are not my figures, the figures are given by them. So you can see that uh, countries with organic activities, you have 187 countries in the world. 
and uh, organic agriculture land is 72.3 million hectares which i mentioned a little while ago and australia has 35.7 million hectares argentina 3.7 spain has 2.4 million hectares then of course organic share of total agricultural land is 1.5% as i mentioned before and the highest percentage of agricultural land out of the agriculture agricultural land area in any country is uh, this tiny little country which is uh, next to switzerland uh, liechtenstein, liechtenstein that is that has 41% and austria has 26.1% and the third one is sao tome and principe 24.9% and of course you know if you even if you take this 1.5% 72.3 million hectares uh, about 60% of that is pasture land you have to keep that in mind because pasture land is uh, used for uh, feeding uh, animals uh, which are being used for organic milk and organic meat and all that you know so what is being uh, given so and uh, producers if you look at, look at the number of producers we have three, we had 3.1 million producers in 2019 and as a comparison we had only 1 uh, in 1999 20 years ago 200000 producers and out of which india has in mean, 2019 figures i am talking india has 1.3 million uganda 210000 ethiopia 20000 so if you look at the total organic market in the world it's uh, 106.4 billion euros in 2019 and uh, out of this you united states had united states had 44.7 billion euros and germany had 12 12 million 12 billion euros and france had 11.3 billion euros so per capita consumption if you look at 2019 it had been 14 euros per capita the world figure out of this i mean if you look at the countries denmark switzerland and luxembourg had the highest 344 338 and 265 respectively and uh, number of countries with organic regulations 108 countries including sri lanka and number of affiliates of iform organics international is 719 affiliates i mean you have uh, in one country there can be more affiliates germany uh, india had 52 usa 48 likewise uh, that's the so if you look at the asian situation the countries with the highest organic share of total agricultural land in 2019 and uh, i have taken few uh, countries in asian asian region uh, from the same uh, statistics book which was published by iform and fcba so uh, palestine palestine they have taken into uh, asia but uh, it's in the middle east 1.2% taiwan had 1.2% uae had 1.2% these are small countries india had 1.3% bhutan is 1.3% i mean this is a very interesting country because in 2008 bhutan wanted to have uh, the entire country 100% uh, organic by 2020 that was last year so uh, then they knew that you know it was not possible and now they have revised it to 2020 2030 but still they have only 1.3% philippines had 1.4% uh, korea had uh, 1.8% singapore doesn't have any agriculture but you know so that's just a little bit of uh, agriculture what they have they have 2.2% and sri lanka had 2.5% timor had uh, 8.5% this is the asian situation and uh, this again i have taken from uh, one of the uh, booklets from food and agricultural organization of the united nations organic foods are they safe what does it say organic farms do not use pesticide is a false statement i have copied this from this particular uh, booklet and this is exactly what it says pesticides of plant origin are used in organic agriculture it is important to note that organic farming also relies on mechanical and cropping practices in place of synthetic inputs organic agriculture tends in fact to rely on crop rotation composting and biological pest control to maintain soil productivity supply plant nutrients and control insects weeds and other pests in organic animal husbandry animals are fed organic feeds and raised with no or few antibiotics growth hormones and others organic food is safer is a false statement once again the same booklet says so the organic label is not a guarantee of food safety organic refers only to a product that has been produced in accordance with certain standards throughout the production handling processing and marketing stages it does not refer to the 
characteristics and properties of the finished product in general, provided that growers adopt proper agricultural practices, both conventional and organic farming systems have the potential to produce safe food. Organic standards will not exempt producers and processors from compliance with general regulatory requirements, such as food safety regulations, pesticide registrations, and general food and nutrition labeling rules. So that gives you the uh, notion that you know it's not uh, uh, organic food is safer it's not 100 percent so uh, i just want to give you a very brief uh, comparison between fertilizers and manure and uh, so we call it organic fertilizer you can see that you know in the media and everybody is talking about organic fertilizer organic fertilizer there is nothing called organic fertilizer it's called organic manure not because of anything due to these reasons. Fertilizer, a fertilizer is an inorganic salt. Fertilizers prepared in factories does not provide any humus to the soil. Very rich in plant nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Manure. Manure is a natural substance obtained by the decomposition of cattle dung, human waste, and plant residues. Manure, manure can be prepared in the fields. Manure provides a lot of humus to the soil. Manure is relatively less rich in plant nutrients. So, I mean, I will explain in the next few slides, you know, what uh, these two can uh, do into our agriculture in Sri Lanka. So, if you look at the fertilizer now, this is another misconception that we have had in Sri Lanka that everybody was talking that, you know, we are using heavy amounts of fertilizers in the soil in Sri Lanka, and this is going to, uh, you know, uh, contaminate with the uh, water and you know there's a lot of diseases and you know some medical professionals have come up with various kind of theories that you know our uh, ckdu uh, kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease in uh, uh, north central province is due to fertilizer overuse of fertilizers and agrochemicals i will come to that later so this is uh, if you look at four, uh, five countries i mean developed countries uh, australia china japan netherlands and korea these are the fertilizer usage per kilogram of per, per uh, hectare of uh, kilograms per crop plant hectare so if you look at uh, the years i mean it's quite constant and you know so it has been uh, going and then you can see that australia had been using uh, uh, yeah uh, 1004 sorry uh, yes 1000 1, korea korea has had been using 1400 kilograms per hectare and China, around 1,100. Uh, this is about 800 Japan. Netherlands is about, uh, sorry, this is the other one is Netherlands. China is this one. China is uh, about 500. Netherlands about 1,100. So these are the figures that, you know, not from my, my figures. These, these are all from Food and Agricultural Organization statistics. So this is uh, a graph on uh, some of the Asian countries, you can see Sri Lanka had been using 138 kilograms per hectare uh, per year. So that's the 2018 figure. One, 2015, it had gone to 307, but it had dropped to 126, 117, 138. It had been fairly constant after 2016. So you can see that you know we are the lowest in the Asian region of usage of fertilizers, 138 kilograms per hectare per year. So India had been quite constant. And of course, the highest user in, is Vietnam, which has highly advanced uh, commercial agriculture right now. And it's a big competitor for Sri Lanka. So they have had, uh, I mean, they are, they, are, they, are, they are using the highest in these, out of these five countries. So inorganic fertilizers. Now that's what uh, I have been. To, uh, I mean, first, gener I mean, we have we can categorize this uh, inorganic fertilizers into two uh, categories. One is first generation fertilizers. That is, you have urea, which has forty six percent nitrogen. Triple superphosphate has forty four to forty eight percent P two O five or twenty percent of total P. Muriate of potash. I've, I have taken only three of them, but there are many other inorganic fertilizers. These are the three main components what we have been importing to Sri Lanka: muriate of potash, which is called chloride of potash, potassium chloride, which has 60 to 62 percent K2O. So uh, 
we have second and third generation fertilizers which are much more advanced and most of the countries are currently changing over to third generation and second generation fertilizers and i will let you know uh, later on in the presentation why we uh, have to go for them so uh, they have compound fertilizers slow release fertilizers control release fertilizers uh, nano fertilizers and if you want to uh, get more information on these i'm sure you can google and find out you know what they are so these uh, second and third generation fertilizers are available in hundreds of different formula uh, that can be chosen by the farmers uh, depending on the crop requirements so this is the biggest question now what uh, the government wants to do is that you know to re replace this organ inorganic fertilizers by uh, organic manure or the government calls them organic fertilizer so i have given here some of the common organic manure uh, and their nutrient values and effectiveness you can see blood meal has the highest nitrogen percentage of 12.5% all the others have much less so uh, now uh, if you take compost for instance it has about 1.5 to 3.5% nitrogen now you can imagine that you know what volume of nitrogen has i mean compost has to be used to get 46% nitrogen which is given by urea current i mean before the ban we have been using urea so urea used to give 46% nitrogen whereas compost gives only 1.5 to 3.5% and this is also not uh, uh, uh constant because uh, depending on the material raw material that they use the percentages change so these are few more items and uh, so this is the situation and you know of course you know release speed and you know effectiveness and all those things you know these are uh, scientific uh, situation then synthetic agrochemical science and myth now Sri Lanka this year got the special award on highly hazardous pesticides from the World Future Council, which is a German-based uh, organization founded in 2002, and uh, they awarded Sri Lanka uh, uh, the the pesticide control uh, the the registrar of pesticides. I mean, I respect the, the two uh, registrars of pesticide uh, of the Department of Agriculture, Dr. Damini Manuira and Dr. Sumit Jayakodi, uh, present uh, uh, the registrar of pesticides for a wonderful job done in Sri Lanka. Now, if you read this, you will understand what, what has happened in Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka had one of the world's highest suicide rates. I mean, this is the, uh, the, the citation given by World Future Council when they awarded, the, uh, awarded Sri Lanka this particular award, a special award. So uh, the Pesticides Act ensured ensures that only least hazardous pesticides are available. It has been used to ban a total of 36 highly hazardous, hazardous pesticides. Sri Lanka's pesticide regulations have contributed to one of the greatest decreases in suicide rates ever achieved in the world. The country's suicide rate had been reduced by 70%, particularly in rural villages and among children and youth. The ban saved about 93,000 lives over 20 years at a direct government cost of less than US dollars 50 per life. Whilst at the same time, Sri Lanka has maintained its agricultural productivity. Internationally, the Sri Lankan experience recommends the banning of highly hazardous pesticides as one of the most cost-effective cost approaches for suicide prevention. So this is another myth that uh, uh, the I mean, uh, so-called promoters of organic agriculture in Sri Lanka, including the medical fraternity, has been telling the uh, Sri Lankan media and Sri Lankan population that we have been using highly hazardous pesticides and you know this was one of the reasons for uh, the the environmental pollution and all that you can see that you know why why we have been why we have been uh, awarded by this organization for reducing the use of highly hazardous pesticides in Sri Lanka in fact at the moment class two class one and class two pesticides are almost out of uh, Sri Lankan market except for ex extremely uh, limited and uh, controlled users of uh, class 2 and class 1 uh, pesticides. All, all what is recommended are class two, 3 and class 4, which are very, very safe. And if you look at the global agrochemical use, this is the 
graph. This again is uh, Food and Agricultural Organization 2018. It had been 4 million metric tons, a little over 4 million metric tons. And uh, if you look at uh, the agrochemical use in a few de developed countries, now this is the active ingredient per hectare of cropland. Now you can see uh, uh, China is the highest user, which is about 12, uh, about 13 uh, kilograms of active ingredient per hectare. If you look at Asia, you can see where we are. We are using only 0 0.95 kilograms of active ingredient per hectare per year. So this is the black one is our uh, line. So uh, you can see that, you know, all these stories that, you know, people are talking about is just myth. And we are not, we are not overusing agrochemicals in Sri Lanka. That's for sure. And it, it is the, one of the reasons given for ban of agrochemicals and fertilizers in the country. Now, this again gives you certain uh, indications. Now, these are pesticide residue levels in some food crops in Norelia district, where our uh, Rotarians are participating from. And you can see that, you know, these are figures from Registrar of Pesticides and uh, research done by them with uh, uh, five uh, prominent uh, agrochemicals uh, residue levels. You can see that ND means not detected. So tomato, cabbage, capsicum, and none of these chemicals have been detected in samples. And febuconazole had been found in three samples. That's, that's the situation, but they are still much lower than the minimum residue levels uh, stipulated by the Food and Agriculture Organization. And this is in Matali district the same similar story and if you look at putlam district a similar pattern is there so this rules out the fact that you know what uh, the the these populist uh, theories are telling us to the newspapers and uh, uh, electronic media and to the public okay now let us come back, come to uh, the effects of this uh, ban of fertilizers and agrochemicals. Now you can see uh, predicted approximate yield losses. These are again not my figures. These are the, uh, the, the figures given by National Science Foundation. Paddy, that is the rice crop, will go down by 30 to 35%. Tea by 50%. Maize 50%. Potato 30 to 50%. Sugarcane 30 to 40 percent, cinnamon 25 percent, beetle 20 percent, upcountry vegetables, where yeah, our friends are from Norelia, 30 to 50 percent drop, and floriculture and foliage plants almost 100 percent because they are done in soilless agriculture with uh, inorganic fertilizers. Controlled environment agriculture, those are greenhouses, what you find in upcountry areas, once again, almost 100 percent. So these are figures given by the National Science Foundation just after the a ban on fertilizers and agrochemicals. So effect on tea sector. Now, the, the productivity of vegetatively pro propagated tea reduced by 35%. Of course, you know, the previous slide, National Foundation, National Science Foundation said 50%, but uh, uh, the, the uh, Sri Lanka Agriculture Economics Association had taken a more, uh, more uh, lesser figure, 35% yield drop. Now you can imagine that you know we are producing about three million kilograms of uh, sorry three hundred million kilograms of uh, tea in Sri Lanka. You can see the the, the graph on the right, uh, which gives the <coughs> figures and production and the local demand and of export volume and export earnings. So we are getting about one point two one point three billion US dollars. This is the uh, about ten percent of the total export value of, from Sri Lanka of any produce. So imagine that, you know, if you lose 35%, forget 50%, if you lose 35%, what will happen? So we are going to lose 885 billion rupees in 2020. And uh, profitability will sharply reduce in both sectors and the state sector will likely incur much more losses. In the state sector right now, 
regulated sector, which is uh, regional plantation companies are already making losses. And then you can imagine what will happen to the situation. Then take our staple diet. Once again, so if it is fully organic, it will be 25% loss. And of course, you know, once again, this uh, Sri Lanka Economics Association had taken more rational figures. And uh, that's why it says 25%, but I, I believe that it will be much more. And uh, here you can see uh, what happens in million metric tons. And we are into imports on the right corner. You can see this uh, blue line, which is going to be imports. And uh, without fertilizer, what will happen? So uh, it's a very, very uh, serious situation. And uh, by the end of the year and early next year, definitely there will be more uh, shortages of rice, our staple diet. So that means, you know, more imports. And uh, we have not been importing, we have been self sufficient in rice, but uh, unfortunately, this decision can make us a uh, uh, rice importing country once again. Uh, somebody, if you have been, I mean, I don't think that you know, all of you are much younger to me. So we have had in 1950s, 60s, we have been importing rice from Pakistan and India and other places. And uh, the government was giving free rice to people. And all that was imported rice. And then, of course, you know, the Green Revolution changed all this in 1960s. And uh, we became self-sufficient. And you know, our scientists and researchers did a fantastic job in making the country self-sufficient. But unfortunately, uh, the rice importing once again. And uh, then coming to agrochemicals, what will happen without agrochemicals to our plant? I mean, uh, the crops. Now this is anybody, I mean, from Ampara area, I'm sure that, you know, you know what is brown plant hopper is uh, caused by uh, an insect called Nilpava lugens. And uh, you can see that vast areas can uh, become susceptible to a brown plant hopper disease. And uh, then, I mean, uh, the infestations, and this can devastate a crop within two that you know, you know that uh, if the brown plant of attack is not controlled, what will happen to the crop? Then uh, coming to diseases, I'm not talking about all that because to save time. So you can see that uh, potato, tomato, especially in upcountry areas, early blight, late blight. I'm, I'm sure that you know my friends uh, from Norelia uh, will be uh, uh, much more familiar with them. And if you get uh, early blight or late blight, what happens? What happens to their potato crops and the tomato and any solanaceous crop for that matter. And uh, this can be the situation. And then tea, for instance. Now, no really, once again, we have a lot of tea and uh, diseases like blister blight on tea. Uh, it doesn't only reduce the yield, but uh, substantially, this, this is a fungi, it's a fungal, fungal disease, and it can alter the critical biochemical char char characteristics of tea, such as uh, catechin, uh, flavonide, phenols, as well as the aroma in severely affected plants. So this is going to reduce the tea yields by 25-30% if you get these diseases. I'm not talking about fertilizers here, I'm talking only about agrochemicals. If you don't have proper agrochemicals to control this, this, is, this could be the result. And food security. Uh, this is what we will come to because food security is the most important factor right now because with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic coming in, all the countries in the world, they are looking for food security. So uh, the American agronomist, uh, uh, father of green revolution, Norman Bolag, uh, in 1970, when he received the Nobel Prize, he mentioned, you can't build a peaceful world on empty stomachs. So this is where what will happen uh, if we uh, challenge the food security. The world must produce more food in the next 50 years than it has in the last 10,000 years. That is because of our uh, population growth. Now, you can see what has happened. I mean, in Sri, Sri Lanka right now, uh, at the 75th position in the World uh, Food Security Index, which is done by uh, the uh, Economist uh, magazine, and uh, 
This is a global food security index. Now we have strengths, five strengths actually. And uh, these strengths are given when we score over 75 points. Now the strengths what we had was proportion of population and the global poverty line. We, didn't, we don't have much market taxes and agricultural financial services, food loss, food safety, food safety and net programs. And these were our strengths in 2020. And that's why we were given this, uh, we came to this position in uh, 2020. And we, have, we had one challenge at that time, volatility of agricultural production. So this is exactly what we are going to compromise by reducing uh, by banning the agri agrochemicals and fertilizers. I'll come to that in the next slide. So everybody knows that, you know, uh, food security is threatened by uh, uh, COVID-19 and all the countries are right now, they are trying to produce as much pos as, much as possible uh, in, within the country so that, you know, their dependence on imports will be much less because imports are not that easy because they are more costlier. And then of course, logistic problems are there. And uh, so what will happen is that, you know, this further aggravates the only challenge identified the economy, that is volatility of agricultural production. So this is exactly what will be challenged by uh, the ban on fertilizers and agrochemicals. So if I talk only about bad side of the effect, uh, bad side of the ban, I should be, I should, I should give some answers also because I mean there is there, there have been certain things which should have been done rather than banning agrochemicals and fertilizers. This is something that I have been telling uh, the government, uh, previous government, and this government as well. So fertilizers, what I suggested was to do away with the sixty billion rupee fertilizer subsidy. It is done. Actually, one of the reasons of this overuse, so-called overuse, and you know people have been using low quality. Uh, fertilizers in large ex la large volumes. So uh, what happened was that uh, uh, if proper fertilizers, uh, the quality of the fertilizer was low, farmers did not get the real effect. So they used to use more fertilizers. They used to apply more fertilizers than what is recommended. So this is one of the reasons that, uh, I mean, this was one of the causes of the uh, fertilizer subsidy because one, once if anything is given free, I mean, there's no value for that. And uh, introduce second and third generation high quality fertilizers and make them freely available. Now, for instance, now we have been importing uh, fertilizers in uh, 2019. We have imported 960,000 odd uh, metric tons of fertilizers, out of which only 35,000 had been from the second and third generation fertilizers. All the others were first generation fertilizers, which are being uh, uh, abandoned by most of the countries, you know, uh, for uh, uh, and switching over to. Uh, high quality second and third generation fertilizers and crop research institutes to make fertilizer recommendations for all crops based on second and third generation fertilizers which is not happening right now all the recommendations are based on the first generation fertilizers which are of poor quality and assure a free flow of quality assured fertilizers through a stringent standardization process this is what should have been done but what what was what happened was that you know we had we went for a blanket ban on fertilizers. On agrochemical sector, synthetic agrochemicals, what should have been done? Introduction of class three and four agrochemicals while banning the use of class one and two being done highly successfully in Sri Lanka. So that is being done. So the, it had been uh, going on for the last so many years, but now everything is banned. So improve the agricultural extension service of the country for farmers to obtain scientific and effective agrochemical recommendations. Now, what had happened in the past was that, you know, the, the, the farmer's advisor on agrochemical usage was the uh, village level retailer. Uh, they go to the retail, uh, re, re, village level retailer of agrochemicals and ask, you know, what can, be, what, what can I use for this particular pest? So what the retailer does is that, you know, he gives the chemical, one chemical or two chemicals or even three chemicals, making a cocktail and ask the farmer to use that. And then of course, you know, he makes more money on one side and on the other side, the farmer is using a cocktail, which is not suitable for the control of that pest or disease. So this is what has been going on. So that was one of the reasons that, one of the reasons of uh, the poor agricultural extension service, which was there about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, when I was in Norelia, you know, we had a fantastic agricultural extension service. 
but slowly you know it uh, you know disintegrated uh, due to various political uh, decisions policy decisions made during the past few government governments so now there is no agricultural exchange service i mean almost there is nothing so this is something that which had to be done and the other one was invite private sector to start fee based advisory services which is being happening in all over the world and you know even in india they do this now i mean there are a lot of uh, high tech being used for uh, dissemination of uh, knowledge and uh, use it and iot solutions to disseminate knowledge to farming communities that's what i just mentioned and introduce precision precision farming technologies to minimize the use of agrochemicals Inten incentivize the private sector to enter to the enter this domain in other countries you know the farm, now the, there is a lot of precision farming technologies being used i mean even the, uh, the agrochemical spraying of agrochemicals is being done using drones number one number two drones are being used to do uh, uh, proper survey of uh, the land uh, the fertility and you know the then uh, pest diseases pests and disease infestations and you know spot uh, application of agrochemicals by doing so they have reduced the application of agrochemicals into the field by 90% in certain places so these are these are uh, clear uh, examples of what we can do with uh, high tech and uh, this type of uh, uh, proper usage of agrochemicals rather than banning them and finally what i suggested was allow anyone who wants to grow organic food to go organic and let the rest of the farming population have the essential inputs like fertilizers and agrochemicals for commercial agriculture after all this is the only assured way to guarantee food security there is no other way and we will make we will we will see what is going to happen in the next 6 months and we will go into a severe food shortage because i'm sure that you know my colleagues from norelia and ampara will know and they will attest to this uh, statement because in those areas there is no agriculture which can be done without fertilizers and agrochemicals and uh, with this uh, i thank you all for being here and then listening to me Rotary Colombo Port City